measures are spent, her measurements will instantaneously affect my spin states, even though we're quite far separated. So quantum entanglement is this interesting phenomenon, and it's also very useful, it's powerful. So it can be applied, <coughs> excuse me, to solve certain difficult problems a lot more quickly than we could with today's laptops or even today's supercomputers. We can use it to secure information cryptographically. We can use it to transmit information, to teleport information, and <coughs> excuse me, also to enhance high precision measurements in, case that, in ways that we can't if we have only classical systems available to us. So this set of applications we call quantum information processing. When I say quantum information, I'm referring to that quantum state, that class. Quantum entanglement is powerful, but in a sense it comes about all too easily. Suppose that I have my spin that has been entangled with Sarah's spin, but suppose that my spin is belonging to some nucleus that is in a liquidy solution, say an aqueous solution. There could be some hydrogen, some proton around that generates some electromagnetic fields and couples to my spin could entangle with my spin. As it entangles with my spin, my spin disentangles with Sarah's. We call entanglement monotonous. Entangle my system has, can entangle only so much with other systems. It can entangle a lot with Sarah's spin and a tiny bit with the proton, or a lot with the proton, not at all with Sarah's spin. There's only so much to go around. So suppose that we're very interested in the quantum state that's shared by Sarah's and my spin. Suppose that we want to use that space to perform some information processing tasks like the teleportation of quantum information. We would be interested in preserving that state of Sarah's and my two spins. We would say that the proton decoheres our state. So it corrupts the state. It causes quantum information to leak out. That's bad. As a consequence, experimentalists who work with quantum systems use very extreme conditions. They lower the temperature a great deal, so the systems don't have very many vibrational or rotational loads that can couple to the environment. They don't jiggle around too much. They use high vacuum so that there are no particles around that could interact with our particles. And they focus on small systems, and ones that don't have very many vibrational or rotational degrees of freedom that could take away some quantum information. So when you and the bar or at me your physicist friend, do you think that quantum phenomena can affect cognition very much? Your friend would probably say, eh, probably not. Because our brains are warm, wet, and large. But in these environments, quantum information decoheres very easily. most physicists would probably say. But Stemfield Pazaltri, who is a condensed matter physicist at MIT, said this. The general assumption has been that, of course, there is no quantum information processing that's possible in the brain. Matthew Fisher makes the case that there is precisely one loophole. This is a picture of Matthew Fisher. He is a condensed matter physicist at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He is very well known for doing research on superconductors, which are quantum systems that act differently. But over the past few years, he got very interested in quantum chemistry and cognition. So he proposed that there is a loophole. He proposed it in the 2015 paper. He asked, what if quantum systems, what if quantum effects could affect cognition significantly? Then how, by what physical mechanism would this be possible? And he proposed a physical mechanism. That's what I'm going to bring to jump off of in this talk. So this idea is going to sound a little bit crazy. Again, most of us, most of the community probably believes that quantum phenomena don't affect cognition much. But his proposal looks kind of reasonable. So we should give it some consideration. And he has proposed experiments. Some of these are underway, so we can approach this problem in a truly scientific manner. What if it's right? What if quantum phenomena do affect cognition? We know that 
quantum systems can be used to process information in ways that information can't be processed if we have only classical resources. So what quantum information processing might be happening up here? That's what I want to focus on. That's what I wrote this paper about with Elizabeth Crossan, a colleague of mine at Caltech last year. Matthew gave, put together cognition with quantum phenomena. We added in the information processing. But in more detail, here's what I'd like to talk about. First, I'll introduce Matthew Fisher's proposal, which is what I summarized as your brain on quantum theory. Then I'll introduce some of the framework of quantum information and computation, which is a field that has grown up just over the past few decades, but it involves a different language than the one used when we talk about cognition. It's a lot more abstract. Then I'll put those two pieces together into your brain on quantum information. Here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to try to convince you that quantum phenomena do affect cognition. I do not know if they do. I am interested in seeing these out the outcomes of these experiments. But I hope you'll agree that this research program is worth thinking about. I also will not talk about alternative proposals for quantum cognition. There are a few of them floating around these days. I'm going to stay focused on one. Also, I'm not going to talk about consciousness. I think it is an interesting topic, but I don't know very much about it. So on that note, I skipped this on an earlier slide, but the bar here is somewhat important. So physicists will say things like, I'd be happy to talk about consciousness and interpretations of quantum mechanics, and cognition and the possibilities associated with Schrodinger's cat over a bottle of beer. It seems that physicists tend to be most comfortable thinking about these topics when slightly inebriated and outside of the office. I do not drink alcohol, so clearly I was forced to think about these topics during the working day. <laughs> Thank you. I prefer to point here if I'm moving around, I probably have more energy, and so you have a slightly higher chance of staying awake. Yes, <laughs> so let's talk about Matthew's proposal. He took the perspective of reverse engineering. Yeah, he said, suppose that somehow quantum phenomena do affect cognition. How could they possibly do so? Can we design a mechanism by which they might? Nuclear spins are known to store quantum information for long times. An example is in liquid state NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. This involves uh, the way of a whole bunch of particles whose nuclei have spins to the right number, such that they, they can be manipulated um, for quantum information processing purposes. So these systems, in a sense, are warm, wet, and large. They have many particles in them. They are liquid state, and they're actually also quite close to infinite temperature. One application is maybe surprisingly, given these characteristics, to quantum computation. Some of the very earliest realizations of quantum logic gates happen with this platform. Another application might be familiar if you've ever gone into a hospital for the use of one of these. You've basically stuck your head in a giant magnet that has been used for NMR. Suppose that quantum information were stored in, these, in some nuclear spins in the brain. What would be the influences around these nuclear spins that could decohere their state, corrupt the quantum information? There are a lot of particles nearby that generate fields that could interact with our particle. For example, water, water molecules, as we discussed before, have hydrogen. Those hydrogens can generate fields that interact with our nuclear spins of interest. <coughs> also, electrons are nearby. Also, suppose that our nuclear spins belong to atoms in molecules. Those molecules contain other atoms, which are very nearby. Those other atoms also have nuclear spins. Those spins can interact with each other. All of these influences could threaten our spins. So, 
could we design a means by which our spins could evade these threats? That's what Matthew did. He basically designed a little molecular fortress. He vectorized the properties that these spins would need to have in order to be protected for long time. But what did he find? He found that the spin should have a spin quantum number of one half. So these could be represented by qubits whose states are represented by arrows on the sphere that you unfortunately cannot see on this slide. Then he looked around at the atoms and ions that are prevalent in biological systems and asked which of those have spin quantum numbers of one half. The answers are phosphorus and hydrogen. Hydrogen is problematic for, for other reasons. So looks like our biological unit of quantum information is realized in the phosphorus nuclear spin. The reason for the spin quantum number of one half relates to the spin's avoidance of coupling to electric fields. Also, the spin should be in a small molecule that tumbles in the solution so that the average magnetic field of the surroundings, according to our spin, is zero. Also, suppose that our spin is in a small molecule. The molecules, the molecule has these other atoms. Those atoms should have spin quantum numbers at zero so that they cannot couple to our spin and be coherent. Some examples of such atoms that have these desirable zero quantum numbers are oxygen and calcium. <coughs> Matthew designed a little molecule that had the right properties that would protect the quantum information in the spins of interest. And then in uh, terms of that set, I find sort of hair raising, back of the neck hair raising, he knows that this fortress exists, this molecule that he designed was known. It's written about in this paper from 1975 by Posner and Bess. This molecule is now called the Posner cluster or Posner molecule, or I'll call it the Posner for short. It consists of nine calciums. The calciums are represented by the loose spheres in that image. And there are six phosphate ions, which are represented by the tetrahedra. This molecule appears to have been found in simulated biofluids, the fluids that are not in bodies, but are intended to be similar to the fluids in bodies. And they might play a role in our bodies. They seem, it, it seems that they might be able to play a role in bulk formation. An easy way to see why this sounds reasonable is to look at the calcium. <coughs> our bones consist of a lot of calcium. A more calcium phosphate is plays a role in both residual films and also closer clusters. And these ingredients also happen to be available in regions of the brain. It's slightly suggestive, but certainly a lot needs to be done to show that these are playing a role in human bodies and particularly cognition. But the connection should at least seem suggestive. Suppose that these are our quantum information storing devices. How might they be processing quantum information? How might quantum phenomena such as entanglement be affecting cognition? Let me put together this story. Phosphorus, which contains the quantum information, it appears in many different biomolecules. One of these is Adenosine triphosphate, which should be familiar to all of us from undergrad biology class. It fuels biochemical reactions, and it looks like this. The triphosphate should signal to us that it contains three phosphate ions, which are which appear here. But two of those phosphates can break off and form a diphosphate, leaving the rest of the molecule as adenosine monophosphate, having just one phosphate. This diphosphate can then enter an enzyme called pyrophosphatase. The enzyme can hydrolyze the diphosphate, can break it into two pieces. Matthew has argued that that reaction proceeds only if those phosphorus nuclear spins form a singlet. So the two phosphates that come out of the enzymes would have phosphorus nuclear spins that are actually entangled. That is a conjecture that needs to be checked. 
Remember, we talked singlet earlier. So suppose that these phosphates enter different poster molecules. Oh. The poster molecules will now be entangled. One of these poster molecules, let's say we were focusing on this poster molecule entangled with this poster molecule. Well, this poster molecule could, it has other phosphates. Those could be entangled with other poster molecules. So we could end up with clouds of entangled posters. And suppose that one cloud enters one neuron and another cloud enters another neuron. Then we have these two clouds distributed as such. So these knots would be entangled. And suppose that two closer molecules in this neuron come together and bind together. And we could ask, suppose that two closer molecules come close together in this neuron, they might have some probability of binding together. Uh, you conjecture that this probability is enhanced by the entanglement and by the fact that these two molecules have already bound together. If that conjecture is correct, then entanglement would enhance the binding probabilities, the joint binding probabilities. Oh, these bound together closer molecules would move relatively slowly. One way to see why is to notice that they would have to push a lot of water out of the way in order to rotate. Therefore, they make easy targets for protons. The protons can easily latch on to these closer molecules. The protons can displace the calcium. They can kick the calcium out of the molecule and cause the molecule to break into its constituent ions, calcium and phosphate. If a lot of calcium is suddenly released into a neuron, the neuron will undergo some interesting activity, which can lead to <coughs> neuron firing. The takeaway is, according to this story, entanglement could stimulate or could enhance coordinated neuron firing. That is one way in which quantum effects might affect cognition. What about this other piece of the story, quantum information and computation. Let's start with the basic unit of information. Actually, let's simplify matters and talk about the basic unit of classical information. This is the bit. It's a two-level system. One of our favorite examples is the light switch. It has two possible configurations, up or on, and down or off. Another example is the transistor. So the switch can be closed or open. What about the quantum version? So the quantum bit is called qubit. This is a quantum two-level system. A good example is a spin one-half system, such as an electron spin, or the spin of a phosphorus nucleus. As I said before, we represent the state of the spin with an arrow that points along the wall sphere in some direction. Suppose that the arrow is pointing upward. We represent the state within zero. This state is analogous to the state of the light switch that is in its up position. Then suppose that the state is represented by an arrow pointing downward. We will often label that state to one. That is analogous to a light switch in its downward configuration. So there is this nice analogy. But there is a disanalogous state. That's a superposition of this zero and one state. That is accessible to our quantum system. An analog is not accessible to our classical light switch. You can adjust that such a state is accessible to other classical systems, such as light waves. Indeed, this is not extremely quantum. To, to look at something quite not classical, we'll have to shift to entanglement or to a composition of those basic units of quantum information. We already saw an example. That was the state of the phosphorus nuclear spin that, was, that Sarah and I shared. We saw this singlet state. This term is analogous to the state of two light switches in which the first light switch is up and the second light switch is down. The second term is analogous to the state of two light switches in which the first is down and the second is up. Suppose that we have now not just two qubits but a large number, say 10. Then what sorts of 
space can it occupy? This is a general pure space. So it consists of many, many, many terms. The first term is analogous to the state of a number of light switches that are all on. The second term corresponds to, oops, this should be all the way at the end, the state of a bunch of light switches in which many of them are on and the final one is off, and so on and so forth for all of the terms here. So it is sort of as though this one giant space of just n qubits corresponds to a whole lot of space of sets of n bits. So it's as though our quantum state were simultaneously in a bunch of classical states, roughly speaking. We can maybe use entanglements in order to perform information processing tasks namely computation, communication, cryptography, and high precision measurements. So quantum information theory was built up in part because of those technological applications. But it has been built up into a giant mathematical framework that is a phenomenon in its own right. It is now being applied to many different spheres of science, including to chemistry, condensed matter, high energy physics, including string theory, and thermodynamics. So we're not only using it to build technologies, but also to probe the natures of space and time and information and reality. Now let's put those two pieces together, quantum information and your brain on quantum theory. What do we need to do in order to put these two pieces of the puzzle together? I have two goals. First, we need to translate <coughs> from the language of brain science, from the language of physical and chemical processes, into the more abstract language of quantum information theory. So Matthew made statements about molecules forming, they're fighting together, they're breaking apart. We need to translate those statements into the mathematics and diagrams of quantum information and computation. So this is a projector value measure. It represents a measurement. So this chemical binding, the, the possibility of chemical binding is passed as a two of measurements. Either the molecules bind together or they do not. This pi represents a projector uh, associated with the space of the molecules having bound together. And this one minus pi represents a projector onto the other space, but not bound to the other space. So that's the mathematics of quantum information theory. But when we do quantum computation, we also draw the circuit diagrams. So we translated the math into this circuit diagram element. We represented, excuse me, each closer molecule contains six phosphorus nuclei. So we represented each qubit in one of the closers closer A, before the binding, with a wavy line. And we represented each, close, each qubit in closer B, before the binding, with a wavy line down here. Now, in quantum computation, measurements are conventionally represented by these boxes, labeled with dials, hence our use of that here. And suppose that the outcome of the measurement is yes, then the molecules have bound together. So the qubits are constrained to have a certain geometry and they also have a certain joint observable. That's why we re replace the qubit lines with coils on the right hand side. So Matthew proposed that chemical binding involves this projection. And we formalize it into a projector value measure and the circuit diagram element. Second, suppose that we can build this dictionary between two languages, then we need to use it in order to analyze how these biological systems might be processing this quantum information. So, let us begin. What is the formalism first, the dictionary that we created? First, we identify quantum states that are accessible to the phosphorus nuclei in a poster molecule and that can serve as a computational basis. Perhaps not everyone is familiar with the term computational basis, so let me introduce it. Whenever we 
we want to process information, we are talking about manipulating numbers. We have some favorite ways of representing numbers. One of those ways is in, ter is in terms of binary. So we represent a zero with a string of zeros. We represent a one with a string of one zeros followed by one, and so on and so forth. When we're representing classical information, if we're representing quantum information, then instead of just identifying a set of binary strings, we use the set of binary strings to label a set of quantum states. Now, a quantum state is more or less a configuration of a quantum system. So we need to identify a set of very nice, useful configurations, more or less, of our quantum system that are good idea to label with these binary strings. They will form the basic alphabet from which we will build our quantum information processing analysis. Now, which quantum state should be these computational basis states depends on which physical quantum system we have sitting in front of us. For example, suppose that we have a bunch of electrons in a magnetic field. Then a favorite computational basis, a very simple basis that's used for a simple set of states that's used as this alphabet looks like this. The state in which that corresponds to a zero or a long string of zeros is a representation of this quantum state in which all of the electron spins are pointing upward. And we label with a string of zeros followed by ones followed by a one, the state in which a whole bunch of electron spins are pointing upward, and one spin at the end is pointing downward, and so on and so forth for the rest of the numbers. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could use as our computational basis for the culture molecule such a set of states, because it's nice, it's clean, it's simple, it's very often used. Unfortunately, our system cannot, our culture, the the phosphorus nuclei in our post, sorry, the phosphorus nuclear spins in our closer molecule cannot occupy such a simple state. The reason is a Pauli exclusion principle. These phosphorus nuclei are very close together. They are indistinguishable quantum particles. Pauli gave us a restriction on the state that such particles can occupy. So we cannot use this clean, simple basis. However, there is another set of states that easily recognizable, that's accessible to our nuclei in the polymer molecule. These are totally anti-symmetric states. That's like this. Let's call one of these states psi. Then imagine performing the operation corresponding to swapping to the nuclei. The result is the same state, except it has a minus sign in front of it now. So Matthew and his collaborator, Peter Ratkowski, identified this set of states accessible to the poster phosphorus nuclei. What Elizabeth and I did is say this set or a particular set of totally anti-symmetric states forms a very natural computational basis. So this is the language in terms of which we should cast our quantum information processing analysis. We also argued that this set of states is a faithful encoding of the quantum information that was stored in the spins before they came together and formed the molecule that came to be in this new anti-symmetric state. But we have our computational basis. Good. Now we need a model of quantum computation. So we define the model of Posner quantum computation. Again, probably not everyone here is familiar with the term model of quantum computation, so let me introduce what that means. Every computation consists of steps of basic smaller computations. For example, suppose that I hand you six apples, suppose that two of them rot, sorry about that. Then suppose that you give away half of the remaining apples. How many apples do you have left? We start with six, we subtract off two, we divide by two, and we have our answer. But we broke down our calculation into subtraction and division. In fact, we can break down those steps even more. Computer scientists and electrical engineers use a set of very basic logical gates or operations or small computations 
some very popular examples include the and, the or, the not, and the exclusive or. We string together these very basic steps, these very basic logical gates, to form circuits. The circuits represent computations. Not too surprisingly, quantum circuits represent quantum computations. So suppose that we have some physical quantum system sitting in front of us, like a bunch of electron spins or a bunch of nuclear spins, and we want to know <clears throat> how much quantum information processing can it achieve? Then we should identify the basic logical operations that it can perform. We should see how complicated a circuit we can create, and that will tell us how much power our quantum system has. So the allowed operations form the computational model. We needed to translate these statements about chemistry and physics, like molecules bind together or molecules split apart, into statements about logical operations, or into the equivalent logical operations. Oh, since I wasn't sure about the audience's background, I wasn't going to show the actual forms of a logical operation in our model, but I was just going to show a couple of examples, a few examples of some of the basic logical operations that we extracted. So this is the representation of the formation of a closer molecule. The six lines coming in represent independent qubits, represented by phosphorus nuclei that are floating around separately, separately in the solution. They eventually will come together and they'll form a closer molecule, so their quantum state will change a great deal because they'll start out independent, but they'll need to form one of these anti-symmetric states. But we argue that during that process, the quantum information encoded can be seen as not changing. So we represent that formation process with this box, which represents a gate. And since the phosphorus and the eye are now inside a molecule, they're they correspond to some geometry now, and they correspond to some joint property that could be measured. That's why we represent these qubits on the right hand side with these wavy lines. I already showed a circuit diagram element that illustrates two polar molecules that might or might not bind together, that undergo this binding measurement, and that do bind together, such that the measurement outcome was yes. We made a whole list of these logical operations we, because we have to take Matthew's long story, break it down into its simplest components, then translate those into the language of information theory and circuits. After making a whole list of possible circuit elements, we can string them together. For example, this is the circuit diagram representation of a physical process that Matthew had dreamed up in his 2015 paper. All the way on the left hand side, we see a bunch of singlets being formed. These are maximally tangled states of two nuclei. Then, so a whole lot of singlets form. Then they come together and form four closer molecules. Then two of the molecules bind together, then they separate, and two molecules bind together, and then they separate. So we can translate this chemical process into this circuit. So if someone wanted to code up this circuit, then we could see how the states would change, and we could run experiments. We could ask about binding probabilities thereafter. So we built up this formalism, this dictionary, and then how did we use it? First, we came up with a quantum communication protocol. We found that closer operations can teleport quantum information from one place to another. Here's how the protocol works. Suppose that there is some closer molecule called A and some interesting state psi. Suppose that there are two other closer molecules, B and C, and some other quantum state. Suppose that B and C bind together. They'll become entangled. Then suppose that C moves up to the other side of the brain. Then A and B might approach each other. They have some probability of binding. Then information about the side is teleported to C. By that I mean the following. Suppose that we 
we had to perform this protocol. Suppose so that A was just sitting by itself for a long time. Then some observable of A could have been measured. There would be a number of possible outcomes, outcome one, outcome two, outcome three, each associated with a probability. Probability P1, P2, P3. Now, suppose that actually this protocol did happen, and at the end of the protocol, instead some property of C were measured. Again, there would be a few possible outcomes, one, two, three. They would be associated with the same probabilities, P1, P2, P3. So that set of probabilities is teleported from A to C, even though A and C have never interacted directly. So you would, some of you will recognize a set of probabilities as a classical random variable. We can show that entanglement slash closer winding can teleport by quantum means a classical random variable from molecule to molecule. <coughs> This illustrates the power of closer binding partially in and of itself and partially to communicate quantum information to communicate quantum information. Then he has another application. So Matthew conjectures that the pattern of entanglement of closer molecules could change the probability that two closer molecules bind together. We saw an example. Suppose that these two molecules in the middle share entanglement. And suppose that these two other molecules share entanglement. And we said, suppose that these two closers enter one neuron, and now two closers enter another neuron. The neurons would share entanglement. Suppose these closers bind together. What is the probability that these two closers bind together? Is it enhanced by the entanglement and those closers having bound together first? A the language of quantum information is very clean and simple. It's nice for doing calculations with. We found a way of quantifying the effects of entanglement on closer binding, assuming a particular conjecture of Matthews. So let me give you an example, a very simple example of two mo molecules. Suppose that two molecules have no singlets shared between them and no singlets inside of them. They have, suppose that they come together with the right orientation, they have a probability 33.6% of binding together. Now, suppose that these molecules instead have, have shared six singlets. The binding probability rises to 100%. This is a way to quantify entanglement's effects on binding, assuming a particular conjecture of Matthews. We found a very neat, clean way to quantify the effects. And I illustrated with a two molecules example, you could scale up to as many molecules as you wanted if you had enough computational power. Then you could ask how complicated a quantum state could these closer molecules come to be in just via the logical operations that we defined? The answer is a pretty powerful state. Namely, a state, here's the technical terminology, is a resource for universal measurement based quantum computation. What that means is, suppose that you would like to be able to run any computation that any quantum system can realize. You could do that by using this state as a resource. How would you do that? You would use this system of measurement-based quantum computation. It is yet another model of quantum computation. It was introduced in these and other papers. How do you implement this type of computation? You Follow this <laughs> You prepare some entangled state phi that has certain desirable properties, and then you perform adaptive local measurements. That means you perform a little measurement over here, maybe one qubit. You perform a little measurement over here of a qubit. You perform a little measurement over here. That's what I mean by local. The adaptive means that the early measurement outcomes inform which measurements you perform later. So by taking one of these interesting entangled states and performing these speed forward measurements, you can implement any quantum computation you want. Turns out that one of those states, one of those valuable states, phi, can be created with those closer operations. This illustrates the form of a state, roughly speaking. Each of these white dots represents 
a phosphorus nuclear spin, a phosphorus nucleus, or basically a qubit. Now, the phosphor molecule, again, contains six phosphorus nuclei. And they appear in two sets, in two layers that are parallel. Each of, this, each of the layers contains three phosphorus nuclei. So they're stacked one on top of the other. So one of those stacks, one of those, sorry, one of those sets of three, one of those trios, is represented by one of the large black circles. And you can see that two large black circles appear in each dashed oval. So a dashed oval represents a Posner molecule. It delimits the qubit in a Posner molecule. And these black lines represent singlets that maximal entanglement between two of the qubits. Now this diagram doesn't illustrate how the Posners actually look geometrically, it just illustrates the pattern of entanglement. But these Posner operations could be used to generate a bunch of singlets, lay out the singlets according to this pattern, at least according to the entanglement pattern, you don't need to put singlets, to place singlets here and there in, in space, and then form Posner molecules. And then there's one more step. Each Posner molecule has to be projected in a certain way. The details aren't very important for our purposes. But this is a powerful state that can be created with the logical operations we identified. Finally, we found the applications of quantum error correction. Matthew Fischer argues that the natural dynamics of phosphorus nuclear spins and Posner molecules would protect the quantum information stored in the phosphorus nuclei. There's quite a different field, the field of quantum error correction, in which people have identified these abstract theoretical guidelines, or really rules, ways of encoding quantum information so that it's protected against errors. Wouldn't it be nice if the formalism of quantum error correction were consistent with the state successful to oppose their molecule. We identified quantum error correction, excuse me, two quantum, let's see, a quantum error protecting code and a quantum error correcting code that are available to oppose their molecule. According to our error detecting code, each poser molecule would store one logical Q trace. That's a three level system. It's the quantum analog of a light switch that has three possible configurations. Very bright light, medium light, medium strength light, and light off. So that is the possible analog of the information encoded with this protection in a Posner molecule, or encodable. According to this scheme, suppose that any one of those phosphorus nuclei in the Posner molecule suffered some error, or it was maybe hit by something in the surroundings. That error could be detected. So those errors are, in some sense, a little bit protected against. So I presented a formalism, a dictionary, a language for talking about quantum cognition in quantum information theoretic terms. And I've also presented the beginnings of a quantum information theoretic analysis of what sort of quantum information processing might happen in these biological systems. You can ask, is any of this worthwhile? Or are we just building a castle in the air? Because we built this formalism under the assumption that Matthew was conjecturing correctly, or at least correctly enough. I imagine that at the very least, the experiments will point to some changes that that will be needed. But we're supposing that at least he's, all, he's correct about the form of qubits and Posner molecules and that binding involves some interesting entanglement manipulation. So should we bother building a castle in the air? Because he could be wrong. You could have asked a similar question about the theory of quantum error correction during the 1990s. People during the 1990s, as today, were very interested in building large-scale quantum computers to run important quantum algorithms, like a factoring algorithm that could factor very large numbers. Quantum computers, like our computers, are subject to errors. They're subject to even more errors because quantum information 
can be decoctured so easily by the environment. Spirit started calculating what would be necessary in order to protect quantum computers against errors. They said, in order to run this large-scale factoring algorithm, thousands and thousands of gates would have to be performed to correct these errors. The people said, we're never going to have active control over quantum systems. We're never going to realize what you say is necessary. Don't even bother. Stop it. But over the past few years, experimental groups have been reporting some quantum error correction. Not nearly at the scale needed for large-scale factoring, but this is quite a start. It is an extremely impressive start. And what's more, these groups are planning to implement large-scale error correction. So focus, I focus on error correction at a decent scale and the goal for the next few years. So I say, yes, it is worthwhile to build this castle that is sort of in the air. First, suppose that Matthew Fisher is correct enough. Again, at least about basics. Our language, our formalism is going to be necessary. You're going to have to ask what sort of quantum information processing is happening in these biological systems. We're going to need to use the formalism that we created and do more analysis along the lines we proposed. Second, this work introduces a new toolkit into quantum cognition, the toolkit of quantum information theory. It also has, we've been interested to see, brought new critics, new scientists into the sphere of quantum cognition. There are a lot of people doing abstract quantum error correction, algorithm building, and so on, who knew maybe of Matthew Fisher's paper, thought, oh, this kind of sounds interesting, but it has nothing to do with me. And these people feel now like they can get involved. They can look at this theory, make suggestions, build on it, and especially criticize it. What every scientific hypothesis needs is criticism. And also, the more lenses through which we can view a topic, like quantum cognition, the better. Also, not only has quantum information and computation been shedding new light on quantum cognition, but also the reverse has been happening. When we, we studied the powerful computational Posner state, we ended up with questions about fundamental measurement-based quantum computations. Finally, this project was so much fun. We got to learn about chemistry and quantum error correction and biology and measurement-based quantum computation. I highly recommend it to anyone who has a lot of interest and wants to prove some theorems. <laughs> so in summary, we reviewed Matthew Fisher's proposal for how quantum phenomena might affect cognition. This was your brain on quantum theory. We talked a little bit about quantum information and computation, this more abstract theory. that we put the two together in your brain on quantum information. We presented a formalism for talking about this quantum cognition proposal in information theoretic terms, and then we performed an analysis of the information processing that might be happening. We found applications to communication, computation, and error correction, as well as just calculation. So we asked in the bar, do quantum phenomena affect cognition much? The answer is, I'm very, very skeptical and rightly so, but who knows, it's possible. Uh, worth checking uh, if quantum phenomena do affect these biological processes, then we have something to learn about nature. If they don't, then we also have something to learn about nature. We have the opportunity to think about some of the most fascinating topics known to humankind, right? Cognition and information processing. And this is probably a fun field to be in. I hope you agree. Thank you. That's terrific. That's terrific. Thank you. If you haven't had enough of Nicole, she'll be giving a lecture tomorrow at uh, 12.30. Did I get that right? It'll be on centre on uh, resource theory and thermodynamics. Uh, but now we can uh, have time for questions. I have a fair question, but I will be the first. Do you want to see any hands? Yes. A very simple question. If you talk about 
totally anti-symmetric states. What does that mean exactly? With this two-state system, you can't have very many totally anti-symmetric states. This is the state of the phosphorus nuclear spin in a closer molecule. There are six phosphorus nuclei. Sorry, it's the state of the phosphorus nuclei in a closer molecule. Each closer has six phosphorus nuclei. Yes. So it's the totally anti. Uh, we're talking about the totally anti-symmetric states of six uh, nuclei. Sin one half system. Yes, and these these nuclei have spin degrees of freedom as well as positional degrees of freedom. Are you mixing in positional? Yes, when we talk about closer molecules, we have to. We're forced to because the particles are indistinguishable. So then it's much more complicated. It is. So Matthew and Leo have written a paper about that topic. Part of Matthew's 2015 paper is about the topic, and Elizabeth and I spent a very long time thinking about it. How is it even a finite dimensional system? How does it? So we basically zero out the degree of freedom associated with the center of mass of the molecule. Then your six phosphorus nuclei, your six phosphorus nuclei are limited to occupying the six locations in a phosphorus nucleus in, in a closer molecule. Remember the closer molecule has two trios of phosphorus of phosphorus nuclei. So each nucleus in some rough sense is in one of those six locations and has an upward allotment state. So those form the ingredients for making for constructing the totally anti-symmetric states. Okay. Um, can I have a second question, which is uh, these cluster things, uh, you know, this is a white hole from a quantum uh, coherence point of view, but there will, there will be a decoherence time, and I'm thinking we've got one over here and one over there at a different neuron. Uh, you know, what's the decoherence time? Is it faster than the speed of thought? <laughs> Matthew did some order of magnitude estimates, and his estimate is he might perhaps expect a decoherence time of the phosphorus, the phosphorus nuclear spins in there be maybe 10 to the fifth seconds. 10 to the fifth? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the order of magnitude estimate, and that is one of the prime opportunities for experiments. So, can I have people building quantum computers with positive molecules? That they didn't think of that? It has <laughs> been an idea floating around since this, came, since yeah. this proposal came up. In Australia, they're using this uh, phosphorus uh, in building silicon matrix, uh, to, and they address the nuclear spins through the electron states. And so that's a sort of well tried technology now, but these are not quite possible. It sounds like that, that's a better way to go. And they have the same basic ingredients as the phosphorus nuclear spins. Right. All right. Well, any other questions? Or maybe the answer is we have such quantum computers. Well, that's right. <laughs> yes. Why would evolution do this? Ah. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think about it this way. One might ask, why bother trying to put quantum effects into biological systems? Why bother asking if quantum effects might be affecting cognition, apart from the fact that it's just a fun topic to explore. And the reason that I associate with this question is Matthew came across a few years ago some experimental results that he did not know how to explain. The simplest explanation he could come up with involved quantum phenomena. So he, he found a study from a few decades ago of rats some rats that were about to give birth, or rather some rats that would in the future give birth, Pre were given, <laughs> I'm not sure if, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if the treatment began before I became pregnant, but these rats were given lithium, either lithium-6 or lithium-7. <clears throat> lithium-7 is the most prevalent type of lithium. If you take pharmacy lithium for manic depression, then lithium, then what you're taking is primarily lithium-7. So these two different sets of rats were given different types of lithium, and also, and 
the experimenters, I believe, might have fed lithium also to the rat pups after they were born. The, the mothering behaviors of these rats were observed. The rats who had taken lithium-7 were less intense. The rats that had taken lithium-6 were like helicopter rat moms <laughs> who groomed their pups all the time and cleaned their nests and uh, a great deal. So they were very, very conscientious. There was this difference in behaviors that seemed to stem from the type of lithium being fed. Uh, lithium-6 and lithium-7 are not just different isotopes. So they're different in their masses, but when lithium is in an aqueous solution, it acquires a shell of water around it that's very, very heavy and would probably far outweigh, it would probably drown out the difference between the masses. Lithium-6 and lithium-7 are chemically identical. They differ in their nuclear spins. So Matthew proposed that the nuclear spin was determining the behaviors. That might be a reason to try to identify quantum effects in <coughs> cognition. We can it seems like complicated ways to do simple things. Well, uh, yeah, but it just seems to me the way you see the other day, one of the in biology, if it gives you the edge, it doesn't have to be too much of an advantage, then you'll yeah. get selected for it. And I think that a few other cases that have been examined, um, like uh, the FMO complex in photosynthesis and, uh, and possibly the alien compass, um, that does seem to be some, some advantage. And so it seems to me the issue is really, are these just a few tips of, of an iceberg that is, you know, that, that life is solely quantum mechanical at some deep level, or are they just little perks, like the elephant's trunk, you know, just things that the evolution discovered along the way. Um, so that's, um, but, but this sort of stuff uh, really deepens that whole set of issues. So it's, fast, it's really fascinating what you're talking about. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you said that these entangled pulse molecules and different uh, neurons would possibly, by their binding and binding, contribute to uh, the action potential going in the, the neurons firing. About how much of a contribution would that be to just classical means of the neuron action potential in the firing? That's a very good question. That would be a very good calculation to do. I think it would involve a fair amount to set up. I think it would be valuable to do this. So, so I will hope to get back to you about that. Okay. Suppose you put someone in a hot magnetic field, like an MRI. Okay, that. Wouldn't that, and people do that all the time, right? <laughs> what effect would that have on these computations? <laughs> Yeah, the magnetic fields would act like a unitary gate that rotates the spins. And if all of the spins basically rotate in the same way, then there's no relative, no relative angle is created between any of them. So I don't know if I would expect much effect, but in I think a paper that he, a short paper that was a sort of summary paper of the status of this that he wrote in 2017. I think Matthew touched on this question, and it also might be in the experimental proposals. Yeah, I just, people might get pretty confused. <laughs> well, they were really depending on, well, we, on these things. Yeah. That would be a good question to compare to this proposed calculation. What is the relative magnitude of the effects? Well, so, so are you essentially the question you're getting at is what does mag what do magnetic fields do to your yes, brain? Yes, why don't if if if, if the, the brain is depending in important ways on delicate correlations. Okay, so there. Uh, <laughs> why, why don't people get terribly confused? When okay, so <laughs> one of the treatments for uh, epilepsy is magnetic pulses. Uh, there's also uh, if you do magnetic pulses to the occipital lobe, you can uh, temporarily induce blindness. There is this uh, experiment in Percy in Canada where he uh, that puts magnetic helmets on people and then induces all sorts of religious experiences. It's really weird. <laughs> but, but, but the MRI is a static field, isn't it? 
I think it's well, the same thing in the field. Well, the whole point is to get space to move around. Right. So I, they're ready. I, they're I, just think, I think I can think I'm thinking, you know, it always make me confused. So, I have a lot of attention. I'm clearly more confused than I normally am. Well, of course, magnetic fields can do many things besides to, 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 to uh, besides disrupting quantum correlations. Yeah. But it's, it, it only is, you know, it's just a whole <laughs> brain, so that might be different than when you have localized you know, fields. No. Right. Yeah. Sure. Is the positive and polish are very unique in its ability to do the sugar like other, like, could be constructible platform field that people could build in the labs and they can help on computers? Or is it, this is the one thing? There are a few ways to go about answering that question. One is you could take the closer molecule and consider a number of deformations. For example, imagine taking out one of these calciums, which has a plus two charge, and replacing it with two lithiums. That would give you another plus two charge. That is a process that was explored by students of Matthews together with Matthew and a colleague in a paper that came out a few days after our paper came out, they took a much more chemical approach. The student did DFT calculations. And I think he concluded that it's sort of reasonable to think that you might be able to that sometimes a closer molecule with class, let's say two lithiums or some other replacement charge that I think was energetically not unreasonable. Then you could ask about designing a different molecule that looks quite different from the closer molecule but also have these protections. Matthews argued that the phosphorus nuclear spin is the only candidate for the qubit because of this list of threats, because of the spins in biological systems, just hydrogen and phosphorus have the spin one half quantum number, and so on and so forth. So he would say that the phosphorus nuclear spin is the only qubit. Other people in the scientific world disagree. For example, I think that Penrose and Hamhoff would. And as for designing another small molecule that would have the right neighboring atom spins and the right size, it seems like the poster was pretty special, but I don't have a proof that no other candidate exists. Well, I'm just, I'm trying, I'm not necessarily thinking for composition, but just in biology more broadly, or designing chemical computers. Yes, so this, these were constructed, in fact, constructed from yeah, based yeah. on just which atoms and ions are yeah. found in biological systems. Well, then, let me ask you this, how does a possible molecule form? I mean, there's phosphorus in there, there's calcium in there, but does it sort of self-assemble, or does, is there a little factory that makes fossil molecules. Yeah, that is something that is not precisely known about polymers, and actually there's a fair amount that's not precisely known about closers, which is one reason why a number of the experiments proposed have been about closers. So it's possible that there could be some enzyme. What we've been thinking of is that there are calcium ions floating around, there are phosphates floating around, and they can stick together, together in a lot of other ways. You know, it looks like a lot of special structure. It's like um, it to be also, <laughs> so according to these DMT calculations, it looks like closers could form and release like, something like an electron volt or a few electron volts of energy, or that might be associated with closer binding. But these these structures, as far as we know, have basically been identified in biofluids, so they do seem to form. What happens if you inject closer molecules into a rat brain? A mouse or a rat brain? I don't know. You can talk about it for the next experiment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's like a very good lady. He's colonizing in hands. The idea is just the injection of possum. The idea is that closer molecules might already be prevalent in these systems. Do they pass the blood brain barrier? That is something else yeah. I don't know. I think they do. Where, where they that they Again, they, been, they appear to have been found in simulated biofluids. If they're embodied, what extent they're embodied, precisely where they would be embodied is not quite known. Did did post on paper them or good opportunity? Could be a good opportunity. <laughs> well I think uh, on that actually that's all for the day. So thank you very much.